Sky News, Shanghai. Well, joining me now on AM Agenda is the Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister, Andrew Lee, and the Shadow Disabilities Minister, Senator Mitch Fifield. Good morning to both of you, gentlemen. Good morning, Matt. Good morning. First to you, Andrew Lee, Xi Jinping's comments about a new level of ties between Australia mm. and China. Are there any risks in, in those new levels of ties, for example, with our relationship with the United States? Uh, David, I think it's uh, a reality that Australia's economic integration with China has been growing apace. Uh, I remember when I was uh, first involved in politics working for the late Shadow Trade Minister Senator Peter Cook in the late 1990s. Uh, China was important but very much second fiddle to Japan. Uh, and that has just transformed as the economic relationship has blossomed. Uh, I was in Beijing last year for an Australia-China forum uh, talking about the engagement uh, it is really important. I can understand that uh, uh, some Chinese would have been a little rattled by the sort of scaremongering over foreign investments that, say, people like Barnaby Joyce were engaging in last year. And part of this is just reassuring China that Australia's doors are open for business, that we are keen on having a, a relationship that spans foreign investment, trade, uh, huge tourist flows there, two-thirds of a million Chinese tourists coming to Australia, uh, and that in ensures that Australia uh, gains as much as we can in this, the Asian century. So that won't put off America? I certainly think America has a deep commercial relationship with China, China as well. Uh, that will obviously coexist with uh, robust discussions around, for example, human rights. Uh, we have disagreements with China over uh, issues such as Tibet, for example, uh, but, uh, but we're able to be uh, firm friends, to, uh, to be frank about where we disagree, uh, but also to find those many areas of commonality. Uh, the Australian architects that are helping to uh, design projects in China, uh, the Chinese students coming to stu study in Australia, both enriching each other's countries. Mitch Fifield, it was a very positive message from Xi Jinping, the leader of our most important trading partner and it's been backed by action as well uh, as I mentioned that the trade fair and the currency deal too. Uh, do you support uh, those elements and uh, indeed the language coming from China? Oh, look we, uh, we support the Prime Minister's visit to China. Uh, it's important for Australian Prime Ministers to be frequent visitors to China uh, and we hope that uh, the uh, the mission is a success and that uh, the outcomes are achieved. But look, it's well and good to, uh, to, to go to China to say the right things, but a nation like China uh, looks for certainty uh, in its trading partners. Uh, and that certainty was, was damaged uh, in relation to Australia as uh, an investment destination. Uh, by uh, the mining tax, uh, by the, uh, the xenophobia uh, that we've heard from this government in relation to 457 visas. Now, uh, that has not helped Australia's reputation uh, as a safe and predictable place for foreign investment. And uh, on the other side of things, uh, China uh, looks to uh, its trading partners uh, from whom it imports uh, to also be reliable. Uh, and uh, what uh, Minister Ludwig did in relation to uh, live uh, cattle exports to another of our trading partners uh, could only have caused concern in China. So, look, it's, it's good to talk the talk and, uh, you know, we, we wish the Prime Minister well uh, on her venture in China, uh, but you've got to have the policies that back up uh, that, uh, that certainty that our trading partners are looking for. For. What about another round of, of free trade talks? As we heard Laura Jay saying there, uh, there's been talk of this for, for quite a few years already, um, more than half a decade. Um, is a free trade deal, Andrew Lee, with the Chinese automatically a good thing when you consider that they can produce goods much cheaper than we can? Uh, well, uh, I'm an economist, David, and uh, it's almost a hallmark of entry to our profession that you have to believe that free trade raises incomes, and I think empirically the evidence bears that out very strongly. Australia is better off for being engaged to the world, not only because uh, we buy things at cheaper prices, but also because we get the innovation, the know-how from engaging in other countries. Practically, how to bring down those trade barriers? Well, I tend to be a supporter of multilateral agreements where you can, but increasingly the World Trade Organization has, has stultified uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a smaller subset of countries trying to strike a trade deal 
looks more promising uh, but hasn't yet delivered the goods so then you begin to look at these bilateral relationships um, they're not ideal uh, but if that's the best we can do to bring down trade barriers to allow our exporters better access into Chinese markets uh, then that, that's uh, that's something we may have to look at. Has it been a failure of, of this government and, and the previous Rudd government as well that there's been talk for so long about a free trade deal and we haven't got really anywhere. Uh, well, these negotiations are, are, are progressing, but they progress on a number of fronts. There's typically an enormous number of things that need to be nailed down in a bilateral deal. Bilateral deals, David, tend to be more complicated than the multilateral deals. Countries are more tempted to put new things on the table when they're dealing one-on-one -on -one, uh, than they are when they're sitting around the, uh, the table with 180-odd uh, countries. Uh, so sometimes you, you get too many issues on the agenda and that, that becomes difficult to resolve. Mm. Uh, I'd, I'd be keenest, I think, to see uh, China playing a real part of a really strong push to bring down trade barriers through the World Trade Organisation. Worldwide benefits of that are, are hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, it's good we didn't see a, a big increase in tariffs in the global financial crisis, as some had feared. It would be better yet if we could bring down those tariffs further. Mitch Fifield, what's the coalition's position on a free trade deal with China? Look, unlike uh, the, the Labor Party, uh, we've, we've always been strongly supportive of uh, bilateral free trade agreements. The, uh, the Australian Labor Party and government have always had a much stronger preference for working through uh, multilateral agreements and uh, particularly uh, under Kevin Rudd. Uh, but we take a, a much more pragmatic approach. Uh, if you can get a good economic outcome for Australia, uh, whether it be a multilateral uh, or a bilateral uh, agreement, then you should pursue that. And uh, if multilateral negotiations aren't travelling too well, uh, then the real opportunity is there in the form of uh, bilateral trade agreements. And the way that you get those uh, is by intensive constant discussion and negotiation and probably um, Australia has suffered from uh, a bit of a, a lack of that uh, by having Craig Emerson as the Trade Minister because uh, uh, as you would know uh, David um, whenever Dr Emerson uh, isn't on Sky uh, he is on another network he is doing a doorstop somewhere else he is almost never focused on or talking about his trade portfolio, he is always focused on and talking about domestic Australian politics. And more than that, he's almost always talking about internal Australian Labor Party politics in the media. So I think it would be a, a, a real boost to Australia's negotiating position in, uh, in the bilateral free trade agreements uh, if Dr Emerson uh, did, uh, did less media, spoke less about domestic politics, spoke less about uh, internal Labor Party matters and focused on his day job. Mm. Well, David, I should just say something, something on that. I mean, Craig Emerson is a very strong advocate for Australia and the world, uh, and I, I'd reject the sort of nasty attacks on, on, on Minister Emerson, uh, who has travelled extensively to the Middle East, to nasty. Latin America. <laughs> Uh, to, uh, to, 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 to Asia. Uh, he's been a strong advocate for Australia's interests around the world. Uh, he is deeply committed to an open Australia engaged in the councils of the world. Uh, I think that's exactly the sort of trade minister we need, following very much in the uh, traditions of uh, uh, people like Bob McMullen and, and Peter Cook. OK, well, we've got to take a quick break here on AM Agenda, but we'll be back very shortly after this commercial break. We're always looking for the best deal, aren't we? I found the best deal for me at Real Insurance. When Money Magazine named Real Insurance best of the best for 2013, the cheapest comprehensive car insurance, I made the switch. And because I could build my own cover from the available options, I made even bigger savings. Build your own policy with Real Insurance and get what you really need at a price you really like. Call us on 13 19 48. Everybody knows we've got another federal election looming. That means promises will be flying everywhere. But how are they going to be paid for? Already there's noises that the money will come from mining. That's a really dumb idea. The mining industry already pays more than $20 billion in taxes and royalties a year. $20 billion. Canberra should be out there trying to help grow mining, not mucking around with it. 
tax mining too heavily and projects go to other mining countries where taxes are lower. When projects go, jobs go. When Canberra gets greedy, Australians everywhere, now and in the future, are the losers. It's never been more important to keep mining strong. Authorised by M Hook, Minerals Council of Australia, Canberra. Here's some great news from Holden. On top of Holden's already low drive-away prices, get the added bonus of three years free servicing. This month, get three years free servicing across a range of new Holdens. Be quick and pick up the Captiva 5 from $25,990 and the seven-seat Captiva 7SX from $29,990. But hurry, this offer ends April 30. Don't miss three years free servicing at Holden. Race into your Holden dealer today. Moving furniture is a real struggle. Hi, I'm David Jones, here to show you how you can move any piece of furniture in your home by yourself. This is Easy Moves, the do-it-yourself furniture moving system. Now that's easy. Just lift, place, and slide. Now it's never been easier to clean in all those dark, hidden places or rearrange rooms to design new spaces. Now available at Big W. My hat's off to your chefs. If Lion Easy's food wasn't up to scratch, I would have dropped it in a week or two. Here I am, six months later, and still loving it. I really think everyone should give Lion Easy a go. I reckon you'll love it. Call 13 15 12 or visit lightandeasy.com.au. So they gave me Bam Power Cleaner with bleach. I was really surprised about how I could use it in lots of different places. I tried it on my stove top. I even got rid of those tough coffee stains off my kitchen bench top. What I really noticed was the shine. Discover the power of Bam Power Cleaner with bleach. Well, in China, Julia Gillard couldn't escape the superannuation debate that was going on back here in Australia. She was asked about comments made by the opposition leader, Tony Abbott, where he compared the government's superannuation changes to Cyprus and what the government is doing there. That uh, resulted in Julia Gillard lashing out at the opposition leader as an economic simpleton. Let's take a look and his response. You know, the kind of uh, uh, economic simpleton talk. The uh, Prime Minister shouldn't use an overseas trip to make domestic political comments. I think that the extreme language of the Prime Minister is unworthy of that great office. Mitch Fifield and Andrew Lee are still with me here on AM Agenda. First you, Mitch Fifield, that comparison with Cyprus, that's, that's overblown, isn't it? Oh, look, T Tony Abbott wasn't saying there's, there was a direct parallel between uh, Australia uh, and the Labor Party's policy in Cyprus. He was saying there were shades of. Um, uh, you know, clearly, um, this government is, is on a hunt for revenue uh, and they're, they're looking to gouge uh, some of the retirement savings of Australians who've worked hard and put money aside. Um, that was uh, that was the point that he was making, uh, and uh, you know I, I defy anyone to uh, to say that uh, this government uh, is is on anything uh, other than uh, a hunt for revenue to um, compensate for the fact that they continue to spend uh, more money uh, than they bring in in taxes, despite the fact that their revenues uh, have been increasing year on year. But even shades of, of Cyprus, I mean, they're two dramatically different economies, Australia and Cyprus. Of, yeah, they're, they're, they're different. But uh, as I say, T Tony wasn't doing a direct analogy. Um, he was just just saying that there were echoes of, shades of, a hint of, a touch of. You know, I think I think the prime minister uh, needs to uh, take a, take a big deep breath. Uh, uh, it was certainly a, a very uh, strong and inappropriate response to refer to Mr. Abbott as a as a simpleton. Uh, I don't think anyone who leads a major Australian political party uh, is a, is a simpleton. Uh, you know, Tony Abbott. Uh, has uh, an economics degree uh, and uh, you know um, I, I'm sure he will continue to be attacked by this Prime Minister and this government uh, whenever he points out the fact uh, that this government is uh, is living beyond its means uh, that it is entirely unpredictable when it comes to policy uh, and that uh, it thinks nothing of uh, gouging money from people's superannuation uh, and if re-elected uh, we know that this government would continue the gouging. Uh, Andrew Lee was that appropriate that sort of commentary from 
and, uh, from overseas, from a, a base like China? I think it was a response to a question about domestic politics, David, and it seemed perfectly accurate. I mean, uh, the sort of doomsday cult mantra we get from the opposition, talking the Australian economy down, uh, constantly exagger exaggerating <laughs> any difficulty for the Australian economy, uh, isn't in the national interest. Uh, you know, we saw again in the Telegraph today, Andrew Robb suggesting that uh, Labor hadn't saved Australia from the global financial crisis. Uh, well, against Andrew Robb, I give you Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz, who has said very firmly uh, that it was Labor's intervention to prop up an ailing economy in 2008-2009, uh, which saved those hundreds of thousands of jobs. And every one of those jobs is a life not blighted by a spell of unemployment, uh, a spell of that sort of deep sense of powerlessness and hopelessness uh, that comes from looking for work and being unable to find it. Uh, that's the difference between the major parties. We chose to save jobs when the global financial crisis hit. Uh, the opposition are still walking around pretending as though the global financial crisis didn't happen, pretending as though somehow Australia could have skated through without taking on any debt, uh, which I, I don't know any serious economist who backs that but proposition. Australia has indeed taken on a lot of debt. And uh, yesterday well, not a we lot. heard... No, I disagree with that. W well, the, 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 the deficit has, has uh, you know, the, the promise of a surplus, I should rephrase, has, mm. has been thrown out in, in, and uh, replaced with the likelihood of a deficit this year. And yesterday, um, Penny Wong, the finance minister on, on Sky News, uh, well, she refused to confirm that Labor wouldn't deliver a surplus in the years ahead. She said that the fiscal strategy would be transparent to all. So uh, does this mean we're going to have a deficit not just this year, but in the forward estimates as well. Uh, we've, been, we've been very clear that we will uh, balance the budget over the economic cycle, uh, but that is also something that needs to be balanced and taken in the context of what's happening to revenues. Uh, we've seen this sort of perfect storm with commodity prices coming off a little, uh, but the Australian dollar still staying high. Uh, and that means that we get this double whammy on, on prices, uh, resource companies returning lower profits because the commodity prices are down, uh, but still challenge, challenges for other firms uh, who, who are uh, export oriented as a result of the high Australian dollar. Uh, that makes it difficult for government revenues, which is why government revenues are well down on their average over the last decade. You know, if we'd had the Howard government's tax to GDP share, we'd be comfortably in surplus. If they'd well, had ours, many of Peter Costello's budgets would be, would be in deficit. That's just a simple a simple economic, Mitch, economic fact. Mitch Fifield, a response? Yeah, look, D David, uh, we've, we've got to nail once and for all this, this idea that uh, the budget is in deficit uh, because of revenue write-downs. There are some simple facts here. Uh, this government is bringing in $70 billion a year more in revenue than in the last year of the Howard government. Uh, even uh, this financial year to date, uh, revenues were uh, projected to be up 5% uh, on the previous financial year. Um, the problem is that this government, although revenues are up, uh, is spending $100 billion a year more than in the last year of the Howard government. So it is completely untrue to say that revenues are down. Revenues are up, $70 billion up on the last year of the Howard government. The problem is that spending is up by even more. The reason why this budget is in deficit and every single Labor budget has been in deficit is because they are spending more than they are bringing in in revenue, despite the fact that revenue is up on the period of the Howard government. That is the truth. When this government the, says revenue the, write downs, what they're talking about is a reduction from uh, in, in the forecast of revenue. Now, a revenue forecast is not a, a reduction in revenue. The, the coalition also has some, some big spending promises, a more generous paid parental leave scheme. It's on board with the NDIS, some pretty expensive commitments. One of the savings that the coalition has identified is in the national broadband network. And we may be seeing a coalition policy sooner rather than later, as Tony Abbott said yesterday. There's a suggestion today, though, Mitch Firefield, that the coalition estimates that the government's NBN could cost uh, in the end, $90 billion, that's well more than double than was what was suggested. It's an extraordinary figure. How does the coalition figure that? 
Uh, well, uh, there, there are, are some reports and uh, some analysis that's been done that uh, indicate that uh, this government's NBN program could cost double uh, what the government initially said it would cost. Now, that's not a huge surprise to us because uh, this government never produced a business case uh, for the NBN. They didn't do a cost-benefit analysis. It was essentially uh, back-of-the-envelope stuff. Uh, Stephen Conroy deciding that uh, uh, the, the, the fast broadband network would be um, uh, a new telecom, or for those old enough to remember, uh, I've, a new I've, PMG. I've got to interrupt because I need to give uh, Andrew Lee an opportunity to respond. We've just got about 30 seconds left. Uh, well, the N NBN will come in on budget, $37.4 billion and completed by 2021. Uh, that's because uh, the, uh, this is a very large infrastructure project, the largest in, the, in, uh, in Australia's history, in fact, of this kind. Uh, and the alternative to not doing the National Broadband Network is the Coalition's suggestion that every household shall have to pay $5,000 to connect from the node to the home okay, I've uh, got by to fibre. Inter interrupt you as well, Andrew Lee, Mitch Fifield. We are out of time. Thanks for joining us on Thanks, AM Dad. Agenda. Thanks, Mitch. The latest news is coming up next.